We are interviewing Richard Lacker of Glenville, New York today, April 21st, 2005, at 3.30 in the afternoon in Voorheesville, New York. He was a member of the U.S. Navy from February 19, 1951 to May 12, 1954. This interview is being conducted by Kenneth and June Hunter. Please tell us your full name and the, when and where you were born. Okay, my full name is Richard James Locker. Uh, and I was born in Schenectady, New York on July 15th, 1933. One very hot day. And upstairs in, the, in my grandparents' home on Colgate Place in Schenectady, New York, uh, not too far from uh, Parkview Cemetery, but uh, it was a hot day. And uh, after that, we uh, moved shortly after down to Elder Street. We were there for about a year or so, and my sister was born. She was born on Elder Street. So we were all born within a few blocks of each other. Um, in fact, my mother, I think, was born not too far from there either. I think she might have been born at Colgate Place because my, my grandparents had come over from Scotland and uh, my grandfather built a home over there on Colgate Place and uh, he raised his children there and uh, mm -hmm. he had five, four or five daughters and one son, which are all now mm -hmm. deceased. And, might be 71 years old, I guess they would be. Uh, but uh, then we, as I say, we had them. And then we were at Elder Street for a while, and then my grandfather had purchased a house on Edward Street, which was just up the street uh, by Fear Avenue, which goes up towards Central Park. And uh, we, uh, we lived there. For, I lived there from the time. I was about two, one, two and a half. She was eight, but I was about a little over two years old until I went in the Navy in 1951. Now, uh, you enlisted in the Navy, and uh, you said you were rather young. Why yes. did you go into the Navy? Beg your pardon? Why did you go into the Navy? Well, I went in, uh, I had no inclination. I hadn't thought about the service. I knew the Korean War had started. And I was feeling very patriotic, you know. I, I said, well, oh, it's those, you know, I don't call it what I was thinking, the like, goops, but uh, I would, uh, but I was in high school with a friend of mine and he was all hopped up to go. So uh, Jack was his name, Jack Obercon, and uh, he was on Michigan Avenue. In Schenectady, uh, but we went went down on the twelfth of February for uh, to enlist. Well, we went to the recruiting station and signed up at the recruiting station, but then we had a week to get. We had to go back, and they shipped us to Albany, New York, to the main post office over there in Albany, downtown at the time. And they gave us our physical. Oh, they gave us a physical. You know, you stand there naked, and there everybody's po poking at you and checking everything you got. And uh, so they uh, they kept us sitting around there for most of the day, and they stuck us on a bus at night, and they shipped us down to. Uh, it was a Greyhound bus. They put us on a Greyhound bus down there in Lower Albany, the old bus station. And they shipped us down to uh, Providence, Rhode Island, where we got a short line bus. I'm not even sure they're in business anymore either. But we got to Providence, and um, we got on the short line bus, and it took us down to Newport, Rhode Island, for the New York for the yeah, U.S. Naval Training Station at Newport, Rhode Island. And uh, it was a cold day in February, and. Uh, we uh, got in there in the middle of the night, and they just put you down to sleep there, you know. But, uh, we had uh, 
had issued us any uh, we're, any of our uniforms or blankets or anything, but they at the training station they had some. You could just go into the storeroom and grab a blanket, and a, a, a pillow, no top, no pillowcase, and grab a pillow and a blanket and just flake out on one of the bunks. And uh, the next day they uh, they got us all together and up, and then they took us over to another building where we went through the thing with getting all the uniforms. And they'd measure you and they'd check your height, check your weight, check the color of your eye. They're going everything at you. Know, say, well, you need so many whites. You need your blues, your undress, your undress blues, your dress blues, your whites, your dungarees, as they were called then. There was navy dungarees. <laughs> yeah, we, what's that, that song? Something about we own our navy dungarees. But uh, that was uh, it was. Um, uh, there was, I'm trying to remember, I have the names of some of the people that I had. Where's my office? My, uh, Mr. Chapin was our uh, chief PO. He was in charge of the company, Company 178, uh, uh, Newport Naval Training Station. Um, and then uh, we had. Oh, all sorts of things going on there, training classes and, uh, you know, calisthenics and uh, learning, to making sure we could swim. And then he took us to a rifle range. It was in a building like, and you'd go in there and you'd get down in the things and you'd fire through the hole and then you'd hit the t try to hit the target out there. I don't know if I ever hit the target, but uh, I don't know how many people they expected sailors to shoot at with rifles. I mean, the army might do it, but not too many sailors get to shoot at anybody with rifles these days, or then, or, or these days. But uh, and then uh, we used to have the parade. We had to get all march, learn to march, and march in formation, and we'd have uh, all these various things to do. We police the barracks, and then got pick up all the cigarette butts and things on the grounds, and. Picked out a lot of stuff up, make sure everything's just neat and clean, and then we'd have mess, we'd have mess hall, go to mess hall. But then we had to, some of the guys would be assigned. Well, they were there for a while, so you'd, for a week or so, you got mess duty. You got to clean up the mess hall after everybody else's, you know, clean up the big pots and everything else, and make sure all the tables are clean. There's nothing left on the floors or the grounds, and then you'd go back to your barracks. And uh, and uh, let's say we got we got through that all right, and then in April I came home for uh, boot leave, as they call it. Then boot leave, you're done with your boot camp. Now you go to uh, you can go home for a while, give it a week or ten days. You go home. Then in uh, April, little middle middle or late April. Uh, we had to report back, and then they uh, assigned us where we're supposed to go. I was assigned to go to the USS Lozier, or DE 680, which wasn't in port at the time. It had uh, been down in the Caribbean on maneuvers or something. Of course, a lot of these ships were reactivated when the Korean War started. They were mothballed after the uh, Second World War. And they didn't have much time in mothballs for they were back out again. By the time they got them in mothballs, time to take them out again. So uh, they said, well, your ship's not in. So uh, they shipped us down to uh, Charleston, South Carolina. I said, well, the ship's going to, when it comes back, it's going to go to Charleston. So, okay. So they ship us to Charleston. And we're hanging around the barracks and everything, and I got assigned to uh, the uh, commissary in Charleston, which was a big commissary. Charleston was a big naval port at the time. And then and, uh, I drew duty. They said, well, Locker, you and this other fella, we got, we're going to send you over to the commissary. And they send us over there, and they stick me in a room about the size of a small house filled with coffee beans. And I'd say, grind it. Regular grind, drip grind, and, you know, regular. So all day long. And it was hot. It was in July. It was in the warm weather. 
in the south. And there was no insulation. This was a fairly, well, not, it wasn't a big building, but it wasn't that, maybe two stories or two and a half stories, but it was no insulation in it or anything, and the roof was like this, and it was hot. And we, as I say, I came out at the end of the day brown. I mean, your coffee stained, and it got on you. you, you you're brown. You, you, you shower and everything, doesn't come off. Oh, dear. <laughs> And um, mm. so that was, uh, we were there for a while. And then, uh, in fact, the, the chief, I got assigned duty doing something else. I forget what it was, uh, but the chief that was in charge of it, oh, he wanted to make me a uh, commissary man and put me in with doing uh, book work and things like that. And he says, you know, he said, hey, you want me to say something? He says, like, maybe I can get you. You know, get just permanently stationed here. And uh, I said, no, I says, I want to go to see us and join the Navy to see the sea. I said, I'm not seeing much of it here in Charleston, South Carolina. So, uh, oh dear. So, okay. So then we were there, and then there's all of a sudden uh, the ship came in, and it was in North, uh, no, it was there. And I got aboard the Lozier, the DE 680. What was the DE stand destroyer for? Destroyer escort. It was a small. It was un, it was an undersized destroyer. It was very short. It was, I forget the exact uh, dimensions of it, but it was short. I have pictures of it home somewhere. I've got. It was another book that I had planned to bring. It had a lot of these places that uh, the ships, pictures of the ships that I'd been on. In fact, I think I pulled it up on the computer. I just put USS so and so on the computer and it'll show me all the history and when it was when the keel was laid when it was built and when it was this where it went when when it was uh, decommissioned when it was scrapped and uh but we got aboard the Lozier. there was another friend of mine from boot camp daniel lewis daniel lewis lucas dll he lives in uh, three rivers massachusetts mm -hmm. and now uh, we when we would when we joined the navy at the time he, he, he enlisted in Springfield, which was the closest place, you know, a big city with a, with a recruiting thing and everything. So he joined up about the same time I did. And when, we, when the bus took us to, uh, from Albany going en route to uh, Newport, <clears throat> it stopped at Springfield and picked up that crew. And we were on the same bus and went down to Newport, Rhode Island. And we were both assigned to uh, Company 178, the U.S. Na uh, North, uh, Rec Naval Recruit Training Station. And uh, so being both L's, Locker and Lucas, we were assigned mm -hmm. similar, you know, not too far away when bunk assignments and everything else came along. And uh, so we went through boot camp together. And then after boot camp, Oh, and I did that part. No, but after uh, when we got done with Booth, he did his leave, and I went with mine, and uh, got to. Uh, we both got assigned to the Lozier, and we did the time on the Lozier, but then, and which wasn't very long because we got a board ship about June or July, and then. The uh, in fact, I might have done about on board in only about eight weeks or something like that. When uh, the Sixth Fleet, which goes to the Mediterranean, changes twice a year, goes in the fall and comes back in January, and another group goes over. Days. So uh, we got there, and uh, we both got. Sh I say Shanghai. Uh, there were they wanted five people. They had to fill a complement for the USS Hainsworth DD-700, which was going to go to the Mediterranean in September. And so they said, well, Lucas Locker, and I forget what, the other fellow, the, one of the other fellows, he passed away. But we're all, it seems like L's. I said, do it alphabetically or what the, but uh, we got this, uh, we got aboard the, uh, we got aboard the ship on the 2nd of September, no sooner got our 
seat, get our seat bags and we go down there. And next morning we're underway because they were it was close timing there, but they had to have so many bodies. So uh, we got out there, and then they would get uh, we had to clean, you know, clean the ship, wash down the bulkheads, the decks. You had to be up there in the main deck scrubbing it all down and uh, get that salt water off of it and everything else. Oh, it was just a while. And then we'd, we had to take the garbage and throw it off the fan tail at the, when we were out at sea, just dump it over the backside. And uh, that goes to gets caught in the wash. And it doesn't go to waste. The fish and everybody, something else down there is going to eat it. <laughs> There never went. There wasn't that much of it for, for the ocean to handle. Uh, Gee, did you get seasick? Or no, I never it? got seasick. Mm -hmm. There were times. There were only a couple of times when it got rough, and we had. They couldn't. They couldn't cook for us in the mess in the, in the galley because they had all these big storage pots and everything else, and they uh, couldn't. They it would slosh out. Or get all over the deck. So what they gave us was cold sandwiches and cough and uh, soda or coffee. I forget what it was. Now, something so he wouldn't. He just he'd sit there and he'd hang on for dear life because the ship is rolling and you, you can't. Uh, oops! I'm over there. And uh, but uh, that that's, that that was only a day or so that we ran into the rough weather. And then uh, the rest of the trip was. Uh, Fairly uneventful. We got went across. We picked up the rest of the uh, the rest of the group, that, the ships that were going to the Mediterranean. And we were escorting the. There were 13 destroyers, and the USS uh, FDR Franklin. Well, there is. There were two ships for FDR. We were on the FD. We were escorting the FDR then. And then there was a nuclear one later on. There was the Franklin Delano Roosevelt, but this was uh, this was the original FDR one because he hadn't been dead that long yet. He died in '45, and this was only in '51. Mm -hmm. So, and uh, it was in the Navy building program. Uh, so we got over. We went to sea. And we got through the rough part. Then we went through the Straits of Gibraltar, and we stopped. Uh, oh, on the way over, we were refueling at sea, and uh, we were pulling alongside the ten uh, for a ship to refuel, and the boom from the, from the, where the oil comes across, there's a, it's hanging on a boom, like, you know, it's, this is that, and then the pipe is underneath. Well, the one on top, Put it, punched a hole in the side and sort of raked it a little bit. So we had not too awfully long. At least it was above the water line, barely. Uh, but then we had to pull into Gibraltar, where the, we went into the British, the British had a base there at Gibraltar. And we had to get temporary repairs to the ship. So they put us in dry dock in Gibraltar. And uh, up we go, and um, so we pulled some liberty there while they were putting the patch back on. They just took a big steel plate and welded it across the thing, make sure it was watertight and everything. And uh, then we had to proceed on. Uh, but we had a day or so in Gibraltar to look around, just walk into town. It was, you know, this was my first time I'd ever been anywhere outside, <laughs> practically outside of Schenectady, New York. And here I am in Gibraltar, first thing I know about it. I said, well, God, my, my, I know my mother had uh, insurance with somebody, like Prudential, the Rock of Gibraltar. I said, oh, gee, I got their life insurance. <laughs> but, uh, but then we went, uh, after we got temporarily repaired, we went to, uh, into the, we caught up with the rest of the Sixth Fleet. And, uh, we uh, had written down somewhere. Where now, while you were on the maneuvers uh, coming across uh, before you had the oil boom mishap, 
Did you undergo anything like general quarters drills for oh, yeah, we did all that. Yeah, escorting? We, yeah, general quarters for yeah. Well, can you describe what general quarters was like? Oh yeah. General quarters was everybody was assigned uh, in case of attack or something coming up like that, you would or you were under attack, you'd have to go to a, an assigned spot. Uh, mine was on a twin forties gun. Uh, five, no, yeah, the twin 40s because they had 5 inch 38s for the bigger guns and then 40s and 20 millimeter for the smaller ones. There. But uh, these were all left over from the Second World War, of course. But uh, yeah, we'd, we'd uh, go up there and then they'd put in some rounds and they were about 4 or 5 in a clip. You feed them in the top and then you go, and fire them off. They were, they were dummy. I mean, they weren't. They'd go when they'd leave, but they weren't going to explode when they hit anything. They wouldn't aim to hit anything anyway. You might catch another ship, but uh, we did that, and uh, that was uh, we did that per periodically. Uh, and then uh, on the way over, they needed some uh, radio. Uh, they need some people to go up to CIC, which was Combat Information Center. Uh, we had to uh, keep logs and uh, write down what was going on, things like that, and such and such. Um, and then they stuck us on the radar. They had these uh, SG-1 radars, which is old radar, and uh, we'd pull that and we'd watch the screen go around and around and we'd look for uh, enemy aircraft or ships. and. Uh, and you'd pick up the other ships that were in your group, you'd say, no, you don't want that one. And they'd look for something that was different in there, you know. So uh, then we had the plotting board. They had a plot. It was a big, like, uh, plexiglass thing. And you'd go behind it, and uh, you'd feed, they'd feed information, and you'd be, well, you'd come down this way to something here, you know, just sort of drawing backwards as to the layout and the things that are going on and, and then see around you. And uh, bogeys at such and such. Well, let's hear another aircraft. Bogey at such and such. You'd make a make a mark up here, you know, and then you put a little arrows. You know, they're coming this way. They're going that way, and uh, that was uh, something else too. Um, but uh, that was uh, I found that interesting. And then, let's just say, when we got into the Mediterranean, we went to. Uh, a lot of different places. I can't remember the order. We were in Cyprus. We were in Limassol, Cyprus, and uh, we were in Suda Bay, Crete, and uh, we got to. Uh, so, so we did eventually at Christmas time. Well, we went into Naples, Italy, and then we went out on maneuvers, and we came back to Naples for Christmas. So this Dan Lucas and I, who had enlisted basically together. I'm not Catholic, but he was Catholic, so, and we'd been we'd become fast buddies, you know, being associated together so long. So he was going to mass on Christmas Eve in Naples. So he, I said, "Dear Dan, I'll go with you," because we didn't, you know, you don't know what's going on in Naples in the middle of winter. And uh, so we got into mass, and did this huge, huge church, beautiful church. There were about seven or eight other people there. That was it. I said, when do they sell them? Don't they have midnight mass at Christmas in, in Italy or what? And I said, my God, I've got two little old ladies here and another one over there and a couple of people, another couple back there. I said, well, we got this place to ourselves. But uh, it was not knowing the uh, ritual, you know, I did not take catechism in the Catholic Church or anything. And so I didn't know, I just kneeled down, genuflect, and crossed myself. And, uh, but uh, Dan knew the Latin part and everything else. I'm in trouble with English, Dan. Um, but uh, that was interesting. Then we got out of there, then we went over, and we went, we walked back to the ship. It wasn't too far to get back. And uh, that was, uh, that was good times. As I say, we got to uh, those other places. And we got over to Istanbul, Turkey. We went up the Dardanelles and pulled into Istanbul. We were there for a couple of days. That was, that was just weird. You know, we got to 
uh, all over the place. I can't what remember. What did you do? I'm sure we... Uh, we go over there and drink, actually. Uh, we'd sightsee a little bit. But there's always some place you can get a beer, you know, mm -hmm. or drink. They uh, find the European... It, it, drinking was why, especially in the Italian area, wine is like water. They mm -hmm. can't drink the water. They drink the wine. Mm -hmm. uh, the water is not good for you. It's, it's well polluted or something. But uh, so to have a glass of wine, you know, listen to that. But we were fortunate we could get uh, whiskey or something like that, American whiskey, because uh, there are places that sort of specialized in that. But uh, now, can you think of anything? Uh, any questions? Yeah. Well, when you were um, in Istanbul, you said. What was the city like? I heard it's rather pretty. Or yeah, it was. Come remember. to think of it, it was kind of pretty. Istanbul. It's Istanbul. It's Istanbul, not Constantinople anymore, because at one time it was Constantinople yeah. for Constantine. You know, but it was it was picturesque. Let mm -hmm. me say that. You know, it was an old city, and uh, there was nothing. It wasn't anything too modern yet, but it was clean. And the people seemed, you know, they didn't, I didn't speak Turkish and they didn't speak English, but we got by. We'd walk the, mm -hmm. walk the streets and look at all the sites and things like that. I can't mm -hmm. remember exactly what the sites were now, but let's say that was 60 years ago mm -hmm. or 55 years ago. eat any of their food or anything? Uh, we or tried that? something. I, <laughs> I don't know how well, I forgot how well it might have sat, but we tried mm -hmm. to stay away from anything. If I can't spell it, I'm not sure I want to eat it, you know. <laughs> I don't know what it is. And I'll try it. I'll take it. All right. Well, yeah, that, that's palatable. I'll yeah, give me a little bit more. Try, yeah. Okay, but I didn't want to overdo. In general, the food on the ship was better. Oh, the sh yeah, the ship's food was good. Yeah, I can't complain about that. Now, so it's not to let our anybody who's viewing this tape think that you uh, went over there just like people today go on a cruise ship. You you stood duties, watch duty, oh, yeah. uh, paint details. Tell us about that. What it was like, and how often you would do that. Oh well, yeah, we, uh, we were on painting. Uh, we'd have to get every day. We'd have to uh, wash down the decks, get the salt water off. And they'd give you a scrub brush, and they'd have hoses, and they'd pump. It hook up to a connection, and you'd hose down the deck, get all the seaweed or dead fish or whatever gook or salt that had built up on the deck during the day and brush it down and uh, let it dry. And uh, we had to do inside the ship too, the passage, lower passageways, the decks down there, because you'd be walking around and you've got salt water on you all the time when your shoes. And so we'd have to clean the ladders, we called them ladders, we didn't call them stairs, we called them ladders. You go in and go down the ladder and we had to clean those off, and we had that, uh, like they have now, you see them, some of these strips for their adhesive, not their, well, people have them on their porches and things like that, so you don't slide, because these are metal, mm -hmm. that you're one, these ladder, the decks are metal and the, the ladders are metal, so they got this stuff that you know, stay to where you mm -hmm. put your foot, uh, pretty much. But we had to clean all the decks down, to, down below, too, you know, all the, uh, wipe the bulkheads up a certain height and then uh, bulkheads are walls and then the deck clean all the decks off and uh, make sure they're good and dry and the decks inside we do we'd use rags to dry them again because of being inside they wouldn't dry as readily as outside so uh, how often did you have to clean the decks every day every day yeah every day that was part of the duty yeah you had to, well, it was, we we're on the deck gang, uh, you know, just we were enlisted seamen, and that was, that was your duty to, there were specialists, there were specialists like uh, when Dan and I got assigned to go down to the radar deck to uh, work down there, which was just keeping logs and uh, doing this and other things, little, little things. And then they, eventually they put us on uh, one of the screens and to watch it go around and see if you see anything and yeah that's fine uh, so we've completed the med cruise we came back we went down we went over there in September we came back 
after Christmas. We went to the, as I say, we celebrated Mass in uh, Naples at Christmas time. Then we. Uh, Did they have uh, a lot of decorations of oh, it? Oh, yeah, for we the had. Holidays, uh, I don't recall right now. They may have had some, but. Uh, Naples was not a rich city. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't like Rome or some of the other big cities. It was, a, it was mm -hmm. a poor, 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 ta poor town, really. And the Neapolitans. Yeah. And then, did the ship have any special activities for Christmas time? Oh yeah. And well, we had uh, special dinner or anything. Oh yeah, we had a Christmas dinner. They uh, they cooked turkeys. Yeah, the ship, the Navy took pretty good care of us, especially with with important holidays and things like that. And we even had uh, some decorations put up on the on the doors and things like that. Merry mm -hmm. Christmas, and Happy New Year, and a uh, little wreaths or something mm -hmm. like that. But nothing, nothing too ostentatious. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is supposed to be a fighting ship. Right. <laughs> we don't have room to carry all of everything around with it. <laughs> Uh, for all the holidays. Did you, how many people do you remember were assigned to that ship? How yeah. How big the crew was? There were about 300. Okay. Yeah. Somewhere I had it written down. Uh, then did you have all the um, bunks that to sleep in that yeah, you we, traded around? Yeah, we had, uh, we, everybody had a bunk. Didn't come to that point where you had to you know, share a bunk. Mm -hmm. uh, they were three deep. And they were uh, they were strung from the from the sides, and uh, they were top bunk. Nobody wanted the top bunk because if we had bad weather, you it's a long way to the bottom. Uh, I had three bunks, and they had uh, metal uh, lockers. They were just they were flat. They're about this high under the lowest bunk, and you kept everything you owned in there. All your clothes, you know, any personal items, photos, you know, your family, things like that. But it, it kept everything in there. If you bought any souvenirs in one of these ports, try to pack it in there. And that wasn't always easy because some guys went crazy with buying souvenirs to take home. Well, space was limited on there. Oh, yeah, people, space was limited. And people uh, think uh, you had uh, quite a bit of space for yourself, but. There are other restrictions, such as showering, getting oh, yeah. your clothes uh, oh, yeah, washed and all. What yeah. was that like? Well, we'd have to take, uh, with water rations, you can, sometimes you can only take uh, a shower maybe every other day because the ship couldn't make enough fresh water for everybody, for 300 guys to shower every day and prepare for cooking and all of the other uses that you had for fresh water. So uh, we might have to go every other day with a shower, but you'd try to wash up, at least do your armpits and clean your face and things like that. But that that's it for today. Tomorrow you can get really washed, you know. Did you have a bosun's mate to oh, yeah. go around to check to make sure you didn't go over, say, five minutes if you were allotted that much time? Yeah, the bosun, chief bosun's mate, yeah, yeah chief bosun, yeah, he was, uh, he was, he ran the, the, the gang, you know, I mean, uh, when we were, when we were, we, were no, we didn't have any particular assignments. We were still just uh, deckhands, and so he was the chief. And what he said went. He did not question the chief. <laughs> that was for sure. But uh, what about your laundry? How often were you able to take care and have that cleaned? Well, they did have a ship's laundry there. Uh, I forget now just how long, but they would. Uh, they had these big drum type things that they put pack it all in, and then they'd wash it. You'd, all your clothes were stenciled with your name and your uh, serial number on them. So uh, when they came out, you'd go through, grab yours, you know. And, oh yeah, that's mine. Okay, that's good. So even your socks, you tie your socks and knots together because, of course, we all had the same socks anyway. Uh, Black and white, that was it. <laughs> Did you uh, learn how to fold your clothes very oh, yeah. neatly? Oh, yeah. In a fold well, and uh, we learned in boot camp how to roll our clothes. You had to roll them because you had limited space in that locker. 
and you had to roll them up as tight as you can roll them. And even everything had to be rolled, and then you had these little cords like little pieces of rope. And you'd come out and you'd tie them, and you'd have to do it in a, uh, on, let me see what they call it, square knot. You'd tie them in square knots. And uh, so when you got them all, you had to put them in your locker in a certain way, you know. All, everything just, because you did get inspected. They pulled inspections on locker inspection. Well, what was inspection like uh, besides uh, locker inspection and compartments inspection, but the general inspection would had to dress up for uniform? Oh, yeah, you had to wear, well, depending on, like if we were at sea, we'd be maybe in undress blues, which was uh, blue. They're like dress blues, only with no piping, and they're a little shorter. They don't have the button, didn't have the button cuffs, and uh, they went on over the head, and they had a bigger... Yeah, because you had expected to work in them too. There's, your dress blues were for dress. You wore those on liberty or for inspections and things like that. But you didn't when you're when you're working around even in the bar, even on shore. You'd wear your undress blues. That's I mean, they're not. That by say undress, it's they're not dressed with the piping and stuff on your on the flap in the back there too. Yeah, one thing people would find hard to believe is that when you had a, a general inspection by the captain or so, they would be so meticulous that they would even check the striping on your to make oh, yeah. sure there wasn't any dirt on oh, it. Oh, yeah, they did. They checked, uh, yeah, they'd take that thing and they'd, hmm, you know. Put that man on a report. <laughs> oh, jeez, I did wash it. It just didn't come out white, white, you know. Well, I'll give you a little warning this time. If you're not on a report, you get a warning, you know. Okay. Now, people may think that uh, you could come and go off the ship when you pulled into port. There was a ritual you had to go through. Oh, yeah, through. They, uh, they were, uh, yeah, we had to rotate it, yeah, as to uh, who got liberty. They got liberty called different times for different days. You may not get liberty, well, if it was one in three or just how it was. Was every third day you got liberty or something like that. And then the, sometimes they would restrict the number of hours you could be off. You had to be back by a certain hour in the night or the late afternoon, depending on what time Liberty started. It usually started around noon. Uh, sometimes it was at four, uh, could be four o'clock in the afternoon, but you got to be, be back by 10. So, oh God, okay, well, what can I do in town for six hours anyway? Uh, so uh, that was... Uh, wasn't too bad. So as I say, every third day you, you pull liberty, and the other two days you had the duty. Oh yeah, yeah. And then the flat hat. Well, we had flat hats, and they don't. I guess they did away with the flat hat. Uh, it said U.S. Navy across here on the front of it. And one time before that, they had flat hats. They had the name of the ship. They have USS so and so on the on the band of your flat hat. But uh, I think I had one one time and lost it or something like that. But I still have my old Navy sea bag. You know, they say the, I had lost all my clothing once and that when they were refueling in my lock. My uh, locker got had an overflow tank in it, overflow vent, excuse me, overflow vent for the uh, di diesel fuel that we ran on. And it backed up right into my locker. So I had to get a whole... Everything new, and uh, geez, I said, "Hey man, this stuff six months yet," and uh, got a whole new, they get new all new uniforms and everything else, and a lot of my personal stuff, uh, say pictures of my folks and things like that, got ruined. And, uh, just, ugh, boy, mm -hmm. ugh. and they tried to clean that stuff out of your lock. You take everything out of it, and then there's still little puddles floating around in there, and you got to try to clean that all out and get it dry and oh. Uh, that was something else. So then, uh, after that, you came back to the States. Were you on just the one ship the whole time? Um, no, I was on the uh, Hainsworth. Uh, let me see. I was on there until. I wrote it down if I can think to refer to it here. I did have it written somewhere. But I was on the Hainsworth. Uh, when we got back to port, 
there was another fellow who was assigned to go to radar school. He'd been on the board ship a while, but I forget now why he couldn't make it. Uh, but for some said, well, he can't make it, so we're sending you to radar school. So they sent me to radar school in Norfolk, Virginia. It was a class A school. Uh, I was there from February 25th of 1952 through 5 So it was about mm, no, eight or ten week course. Uh, as I say, uh, it's, uh, it says I claimed prior service in the National Guard from 9-14-49 to 21851, which is the day before I enlisted in the Navy, before I went in. And you're but, saying when you enlisted in the Navy, you were telling us earlier, yours was a different kind of enlistment. It wasn't the standard enlistment. No, I was on a minority enlistment. Uh, I was under, I was only 17 years old at the time. I was, uh, my birthday is in July, and I joined up in February. Of, uh, I wouldn't be 18 until July. So my parents had to sign so that I could go into service. So they went down to the post office, and they had to be had to be witnessed. They had to go down and uh, sign in front of an officer that that it was all right by me, by them that I do this. And being that there was a conflict going on at the time, that that's understandable. But as I say, because of my age, I wasn't legal. They, I had no power. Or, I had to, whatever my parents said was what I did. So they had to say I could do it. So, so I did. Did they didn't mind you going in so young? No, they didn't. No, they they were they were they resigned to me doing it. I guess I was already had better than I was about halfway through my senior year in high school when this other friend of mine decided to go in the navy. I said, well, "Okay, I'll go with you, Jack." So I came home and sprang that on him. I said, "I can join the navy with Jack." Oh God. But uh, they didn't mind your quitting school in your senior year. Well, they weren't too crazy about it. But they figured I must must have made up my mind what I was mm -hmm. going to do. Uh, so I say we uh, we went down there on the twelfth. Uh, uh, yeah, you see, it says there I enlisted on two ten fifty one. Mm -hmm. That'd be February tenth. Right. But that's when I went down to first see about it. Then it was uh, was the 19th before the, I forget what day of the week, the 10th of uh, February was in 1951, but I had to wait about a week before there had been another group going down. So then, uh, then they shipped us to Albany for our major physical, and then mm -hmm. later in the day they swore us in. We were in, uh, in they took us and you pledged to do this. Do you think there were a lot of other people that were under age too, or did well, you Well, no, I don't know about, not, not, not from, well, there weren't that many going from Schenectady at that mm -hmm. time, or even from, uh, there may have been some, but it wasn't, mm -hmm. it wasn't predominant. No, I just was yeah. fed up with high school, I mm -hmm. guess. Uh, so then when uh, you got back from the Mediterranean, you went to radar school in Norfolk. Mm -hmm. Then what did you do after that? You did get to see a lot of the world, I assume. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. So uh, after radar school, and that's after we had done, done the med cruise, uh, I went back, let me see, went back to the ship, and then uh, we went uh, to the went down to uh, Puerto Rico, and we went to the Virgin Islands, and we came back up, and uh, I was on there for, I wrote the exact dates from, from the different ships, I think. Uh, I, was, I made Radarman third, third class, is third mm -hmm. class, second class, first class, and chief. Now there's a couple more chiefs above that, but that time that was about it. Uh, so I made third class, uh, and uh, 
So you didn't have to swab the decks anymore down no, the No, no. Well, we had to keep our own areas clean. That's all we had to do. I see. I believe you were also in Cuba, Scotland, St. Yeah. John's, yeah. Nova Scotia, oh, yeah. and of course the famous bean town, Boston there. Oh, yeah, Boston beans, yeah. And you, you had mentioned earlier that I believe your grandparents were from Scotland. Yes. My Did you have an opportunity to do any tracing down of the family in Scotland? I got, we got to Scotland. And they pulled into Greenock, Scotland. It's, it's, it's pronounced Greenock, but it's G-R-E-E-N-O-C-K, like Greenock, but Greenock. And my grandmother on my father's side lived in London. So I was able to get leave. And I got aboard, I forget the name of the train, it's this famous train that goes from Glasgow down to London overnight, during the night. So I got aboard that and went down to London. And then I went to Euston Station in London. And I had to get out there. And, but how do I get to the, where, you know, but I, the people were very accommodating. They said, no, you catch this uh, sub, you know, like, well, we don't call it. The, the tubes there, mm -hmm. I forget what they call it. Tubes. But uh, I said, so take this one, that one. And, and I spoke English, that was yeah. wonderful too, wasn't it? Huh? <laughs> they spoke English Oh too. yeah, yeah. Well, I was familiar with it because mm -hmm. my father was English and my parent, grandparents on my mother's side were Scottish, so it, the language came fairly easy mm -hmm. to me because uh, my, uh, my parent, my father had friends who'd been over here from the old country visiting from time to time, and they came over after the war. John, I mean, I forget their last name. Uh, they were over here. And, uh, it, was, it was nice. But I caught up with my grand. My grandmother lived in uh, southeast London, and uh, I got down there and I came up. And I said, uh, I got to get over to Ninehead Street, N Y N E H E A D, Ninehead Street. And then I find Nineth Street now. And said, Excuse me. And you go down the, I forget the High Street. You go down the High Street, and then you go out so far, and then you take a take a left, go down the hill, and it'll be over there on your uh, left, on your right. And there's another mm -hmm. little street down there. So uh, I found it, and I stayed with her for. Uh, couple of nights and that, they were still in rationing and everything else. Just, I got an egg. They had an egg. She had an egg. I'll give you my egg. So I, she, I, she didn't have an awful lot of food at that time. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, she fed me and pretty well. And we walked up to High Street and looked around, you know, the different shops. Couldn't, couldn't buy much of anything. Uh, but I enjoyed that immensely. Uh, so uh, after that, uh, I went back to the sh went back to the ship, and uh, where did we go then? Oh, I had to get back up to Glasgow to catch the catch the ship. So she put me on the train and zip back up north and I'd sit there and I'm chatting with a couple of different people that uh, one was an English sailor and uh, there was another couple that we just you know hi Jane hi Yank you know so that, mm -hmm. it was just friendly they were very friendly you know mm -hmm. and they were, so we had a great time and just chatting and sleeping and everything <laughs> mm -hmm. try to sleep <laughs> the moving train yeah and it was uh, but we got back up there, and uh, then we took off. Now, which uh, ship were you, you assigned to at this time? That was on the, uh, let's see, I think that was on the... Uh, the Strickland? Could have been the Strickland, yeah. The, uh, so the DER was a destroyer escort radar. That was... Uh, that was after I got back and got to radar school, and then the, mm -hmm. the friend of uh, when I was on board, but aboard the Hainsworth, there was another fellow who was looking. He was a radarman, and he wanted to get assigned. He wasn't on our ship, but he was on a different ship, and you, they had this. Well, I wouldn't say it's email, but you could get in touch with somebody. 
uh, he wanted to be where I was, that down south, and I wanted to get back up further north. So uh, we worked that out, and uh, we got a swap. He came down to my ship. He got in. Okay, now locker, you can go. So uh, I went up, and uh, the Strickland was going to be at Newport, I guess. And I get up there, and it wasn't there right away. Oh yes, it was. Oh, yes, it was there. But then I just, I got some leave, and I was coming home. So I had to go. I was going up to Boston to catch the train from Boston to Albany. No, I was going to fly. Excuse me. I was going to get a hop, you know, to fly. But uh, the the yeoman who typed up the leave papers overslept or didn't do. He didn't do them the night before, so I'd have them first thing in the morning to go ashore. So I said, oh, nuts, so I missed that. So I said, well, I'll go into Boston and catch the train. So I get into Boston, and I got a little time to kill. I'm standing around Boston Common, and a news, newsboy goes by and says, airliner crashes at Albany. Boston liner crashes. That was the plane I was supposed to be on. Mm -hmm. That's the one I missed. And I thought, oh, my God. Oh, my heart had just... Oh my God! Mm -hmm. So I immediately, I said, "I got to find a phone because my parents are expecting me on that plane." And at the time, it took down the WPR towers and went across Central Avenue and took out a motel, and there were no survivors on that plane. Mm -hmm. So I called. I called home and said, "I'm all right. I'm all right. I'm all right, Ma. Ma, I'm okay. I missed the plane. Fine. I just, but uh, then I, let's say, I took the bus home." And, oh God, it was, it was, it did something to me because I said, like, how close did I come to dying the mm -hmm. bird? I was only a kid. I said, oh my God. So that, uh, that was, uh, then when I got to the Strickland, uh, that was on the Strickland, yeah, I got to, he wanted to, he wanted to go south and I wanted to go north and I got up there. Then the Strickland, we, uh, Went up to St. John's, Nova Scotia. Am I running over? Mm -hmm. We got to St. John's, Nova Scotia, and uh, we're in, of course, we're in Boston. And uh, I think that was, uh, there was some place. Uh, in St. John's? Huh? You were at St. John's, no? Yeah, St. John's, Nova Scotia. Yeah, we got up to St. John's. And there was some place in, uh, around Maine, I'm not sure. Portland. But I'm vague on it now, I mean, as I say, it was so long mm -hmm. ago. But it was just a great time. You know. And then did you uh, get discharged from... Yeah, I got discharged from the same place I went in. I went in on uh, February 19th, 1951, and I got out on May 12th, 1954. At the time, after the Korean War was winding down a little bit and the services had to cut down a certain number of people out. They had limits on manpower. So I was due to get out from, uh, being on a minority list, but I had to be out by the 14th of July because I, on the 15th I was on a my, my Once uh, I hit 21, or 19, yeah, once I hit 21, my signature as a minor wouldn't be invalid. I have to sign up again as an as an adult, which was eight. You know, and that's when they changed adults. <laughs> it was eighteen at one time. You could vote too, but uh, I was, of course, older. But uh, still, it uh, that was the terms that I went in on, so mm -hmm. I had to do it. So I got out. <coughs> I was due to get out on uh, May nine, May. 4th. Let me see. Yeah, I mean, there were two months ahead. That would have been May 19th, or May 14th, 1954. But uh, I was at Newport, Rhode Island again to be discharged. 
where I went into in my recruit training, where I get out, I get discharged. In the same barracks. Mm -hmm. I, I think I might have even had the same bunk. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, that's talk, talk about coming full circle. I said, oh my God. Because when we got back to be discharged, I, said, I know that place. I know that barracks. I said, mm -hmm. upstairs on the second deck. Right there, I said, that's us, mm. and uh, so that was, that was just something else. Said, oh my God! So talk about going full circle in your life. Mm -hmm. And so then, uh, when you left, what did you do after you got out of the service? Well, after I got out of the service, I had met, uh, but she's not here. Uh, I had the previous uh, fall. I'd been home around Halloween and I had my cousin Jim Phillips he lived in the house where I was born it was my cousin but the house stayed in the family the lockers moved out and the Phillips moved in and uh, he was going to uh, go up to Danny's which was up on State Street uh, just before you get to Balltown Road now but it's gone now but we went in there and uh, he had a date with some girl or other, and uh, his, she brought along her girlfriend, Sylvia. And I met Sylvia, and first thing you know, she we uh, we started dating on and off. But then uh, I met her in October of '53. Yeah. Because then in September of 54, September 4th, 1954, we got married up in Woodlawn, I think it's Woodlawn Reformed Church or something mm -hmm. like that. We got married up there. <clears throat> so I was on the 4th of September. Then about the 16th of October, and uh, she didn't want to have any children. She had this birth control thing, you know, they had the old stuff that would go charts and everything else and you don't do this, don't do that. Well, that worked fine until the 16th day of October, a month and uh, 12 days later, she conceived. And we were, uh, oh God, we were staying with her folks at the time because we hadn't gotten settled. So then we got an apartment. Uh, Oh no, we, we had moved out of there, parents, excuse me. We were living down on Robinson Street, mm -hmm. uh, just below uh, Lincoln School is, only on the other side, going up toward the hill. Three minutes? Okay. Um, we were going up there, and then uh, we got an apartment there, and then uh, we moved out. Of, we were only there a few, a couple of months. We were there through. Christmas, I think, and then we moved up to 1538 State Street, was just mm -hmm. up State Street ways, a couple of blocks above my parents, above mm -hmm. Edwards or Fear Avenue. So we were 1538 State Street when Dan was, uh, mm -hmm. he was being born, he was born in Ellis Hospital. Now, did you get a job in the I Street was working Street? at the uh, Mohawk Club oh, yeah. in mm -hmm. Schenectady. My father had been there since about 1929. Mm -hmm. And he was the head waiter there. He and Herbie Weiwegger. Mm -hmm. He was a we had one German head waiter and one English head. Mm -hmm. And my, he, well, my father was more or less second to Herbie, mm -hmm. but uh, they were pretty much equal. And uh, so I worked there as a bus boy, and then I got a job as uh, they uh, sent me into the bar down the bar. I was bar boy. I would serve drinks to the table. They had a round table there, where the people like the Jalen, the Reed, all the bankers, and everybody would come in at night, and they'd sit around the table, and they'd have their high, they'd have their Manhattans and their martinis, and I'd serve them and this and that, and then, uh, and I graduated to tending bar uh, when Ben Jones or somebody couldn't make it, Ray Waters mm -hmm. or Ben Jones couldn't make it, say, because I'd picked up, you know, I can mix this thing or I can mix that thing. Because when they wanted a when they wanted a martini, uh, I'll have a martini, no vermouth. <laughs> just just like a lot. You go just just say the word <laughs> vermouth over it. Go, okay, that's enough. <laughs> okay. But, uh, well, I guess this is about uh, time's running yeah, out, and good. I know you 
went on to work for General Electric. Oh yeah, we're General Electric, Lockheed Martin. Lockheed, Martin. Lockheed Martin. Yeah, and yeah, I retired from Lockheed Martin about uh, let me see, I'm 72. I can worked all the way through 65. Mm -hmm. I went, through, I had 65, but then I said, well, I'm going to work all the way through 19, yeah, you know, my 65th mm -hmm. year, and I did. And then uh, my, like my foreman wanted me to stay on some more. I said, no, Jack. I was, we're down there in the old two guys building mm -hmm. on uh, Lafayette Street. It was nice down there. And, uh, and, uh, but, uh, well, Knowing what you know, know now, would you, have, would you still do it all over again? Well, I don't know. I, it turned out, everything turned out all right, but I'm not sure what the unknown would have been, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, who, who can say what, yeah. what, one in, what could, what one thing might have changed? Right. You know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, thank you very much well, for right. sharing your experiences in the Navy. I'm sorry. It's. <laughs>